Well, welcome everyone to another episode of Scaling Up, the podcast where we dive deep into the strategies and concepts behind successful business growth. I am John Reed. I am a fractional chief revenue officer, and I provide services to help small and medium-sized businesses with their sales leadership. I am part of the Sales Acceleration Sales Leadership Consortium based out of the Philadelphia area. You're listening to Scaling Up, a podcast for business leaders. One of the key factors, uh, as many of you know, in accelerating business growth is to drive continuous sales pipeline development. If you are not consistently at, depends on the market, depends on your business, but three to five times your revenue targets in your pipeline, you're probably not going to be able to ultimately meet your revenue goals by the end of the year. So you want to make sure that you are continuously developing a healthy and sustainable pipeline so that you can ultimately meet and exceed your revenue goals by the end of the, by the end of the year. So how do you do that? Well, there's a number of ways. Uh, we're not going to talk about every one in this podcast, but one in particular that, um, has uh, maybe flown under the radar of late, has been used before, but with new capabilities and technologies and techniques, has come about to be yet another tool in your toolbox that you should certainly take advantage of. So imagine you had an ability to perfect cold outreach, and we'll explain that a bit, uh, to turn that into what some in the past might have might have uh, referred to as kind of spammy, but into a gold mine of opportunities to help you develop that, that upfront pipeline. That's what we're gonna talk about today. Our guest today has done just that. Uh, Bill Dillon is president of E-Lead Corp. I've known Bill for three to four decades. Yeah, that's decades. Bill, did I do that math right? Um, uh, it, it's actually four plus, four so, plus. but okay, yeah. who's counting? I was trying to, was trying to be uh, kind there. So his entrepreneurial journey has been nothing short of inspiring. Um, currently, he provides top of the funnel BDR services to small and medium sized businesses and help them craft their message so that they can get qualified meetings and again, fill that top of the pipeline. So let's welcome the man who has revolutionized cold outreach, Bill Dillon. Bill, welcome to the show. Thanks, John. Yeah. So that you know, uh, that's 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 a hard top line to uh, to meet, but I know that you will exceed those expectations. So just to start off with some uh, some broad questions, just in general, um, you've had a long and varied entrepreneurial journey. Can you share with us? how you got started and what led to your current role as a B- in BDR services. Yeah. Um, my brother and I had started a moving and storage business uh, back in the 80s. And, uh, you know, uh, we were cold call. Uh, you know, we started in B2C. We were doing household goods. And uh, if we weren't out doing moves, we were, you know, making calls, setting appointments. So uh, that's how we started. Eventually, we migrated to uh, O&I office and industrial moving and uh, hired salespeople, had them making the calls and developed a process for setting appointments. And then uh, we realized that we wanted them customer facing. They had to see, you know, because the moving and storage business was a series of one and done opportunities, they had to see 20 new prospects each week. So they didn't have, I didn't want them cold calling. So we actually hired high school and college students to, uh, to make calls and set appointments to keep our, our outside reps uh, in front of prospects. Uh, so that's where it started. And then eventually we spun off the, uh, uh, the lead generation portion of it, uh, which became a call center and evolved into a company called the Wendover Corporation that identified companies that were relocating. And uh, at one point, Wendover had over 100 people in the call center. And then we still had our own people calling into the leads that we got from Wendover and setting appointments. So we, we developed a process early on. Uh, and uh, in uh, 1999, uh, my brother, the Wharton grad, who decided he'd rather sell leads than move heavy furniture, the smart guy, um, had a new product for the technology industry and sold the business, the moving business and 
uh, started uh, selling sales leads to tech companies. So I went from the most atechnical industry on the planet, right? You got the internal combustion engine, probably the biggest piece of technology to impact the moving business. Uh, to at that time, you know, it was 1999, a lot of Y2K, a lot of e-commerce solutions, uh, a ton of staffing. There was shortage of a million technical people. And, and I just assumed these guys had had the experience that I had. And I started getting calls saying, your leads suck. I'm not getting any, you know, not getting anywhere with them. And so I went in and I started meeting with clients and I was dealing with 75 different types of technology companies. So um, I had to learn about what they did uh, and then be able to coach them because it became apparent these guys had never made a cold call in their life. A lot of them were technical guys that moved into sales roles, didn't have any sales training, never cold called. So I spent six years actually traveling around uh, teaching uh, technology salespeople uh, how, uh, how to make cold calls and set appointments. And then eventually I got tired of banging my head against the wall trying to get them to do it and uh, built my own call center. And we started making outbound calls on behalf of these companies. Uh, our program was funded by Microsoft, Avaya, Shortel, Nortel. Um, they all uh, were uh, brought us in to help their resellers uh, get more uh, top of the funnel appointments. And so that's what we did for them. So uh, yeah, for a long time, I've been involved with hiring, training, and managing uh, you know, outside, inside and outside, but predominantly um, SDRs, BDRs, uh, appointment setters. Mm -hmm. So, well, so that's it in a nutshell. That's everything I've done. Yeah, that's, that's uh, quite, quite a journey. And it sounds like you've built uh, along the way, uh, you've built upon your expertise and talent and skills and knowledge that you've gained you know, at every phase to get to where you are now. Well, so over that time period, what would you say are some of the more uh, significant challenges that you faced and how did you, how did you get around them? Well, especially in the call center side and the SDR side, I mean, sales in general, you're always dealing with a lot of turnover. So with us, it, the important thing was to develop a process and a training program to get these people productive as quickly as possible. Uh, another problem was, I think in general, and that's what I discovered with the other companies that I worked with, that th their expectations were really skewed. Uh, you know, I'd, I'd ask them, you know, what's going on? And they'd tell me, well, nobody's calling me back. And I'm like, well, well how many times did you call? Once, twice, three times? I'm like, are you kidding me? My inside reps made 60 dials an hour to schedule one appointment an hour. So we knew exactly what the success metrics were. Mm -hmm. But these guys had, you know, no idea what was going on. So a lot of times just, you know, helping them understand the success metrics, how many calls they needed to make in order to engage somebody, how many times they needed to reach out to them, uh, you know, was was a big part of getting them to to appreciate the process and uh, and understand what it was going to take in order for them to be successful and set appointments in, in whatever their particular market was. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, setting the correct expectations and also, you know, a lot of times these companies provided no training because they didn't have any experience doing it. So um, so they didn't really have a, a training vehicle or an understanding of what the expectations should be for those reps. Mm -hmm. So as I mentioned earlier on, uh, you know, expanding, expanding one's uh, total pipeline uh, is key to growth, obviously. And sure. you, know, you can certainly expand your pipeline by selling new stuff to existing clients or selling to new departments in, a, in existing clients. So expanding your current base, but that only gets you so far, typically. So a, a key piece of growth has to be getting new logos. So a cold outreach, um, you know, in the past has kind of had a bad reputation or kind of spammy, et cetera. So how have you been able to transform uh, the perception of cold outreach into a, a real tangible business asset for your clients? Okay. Well, there, there are a couple of things. We have to discuss the elephant in the room. There's, uh, there's, Everybody owns call avoid, avoidance, and some reps just just don't want to do it. They just won't do it. Um, I have a, a good friend of mine who's one of the top sales reps wherever he goes, and uh, his company gives him leads all the time. 
And he's always at a multiple plant. He always hits his number. He's never going to get fired. He's, you know, they, that's just the guy he is. And he says, yeah, I get sales leads from the marketing department, but I don't call them. I'm like, well, how do you reconcile that? Yeah. He says, well, I tell my boss the leads are terrible. <laughs> he goes, he's not going to get fired. But in a lot of cases, they're, you know, they're not, wait, you know, they're wasting their time, wasting their money um, with somebody. It's just, you know, if they're hitting their numbers, who cares? And, and you're absolutely right in terms of every sales pundit on the planet will tell you your first source of new business is your existing customers and referrals. But the problem is like you said, if you don't add new logos, there's always going to be attrition. You're going to lose customers and, and, and you've got to replace, at least replace them to, to maintain where you are. If you want to grow, you absolutely have to add new logos. And the only way to do that is, is to, to actually get on the phone and talk to them, you know, co you know, follow up on the leads that, uh, um, that are being generated by marketing or any of the inbound stuff. And, and a lot of times people just aren't making enough effort uh, to, to secure a lead or get a hold of somebody. You know, it, 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 it takes a lot today. When I started my moving business, there was no caller ID, there was no email, you know, so there were, there were a lot less barriers to entry than there are today. So the metrics have changed, mm -hmm. but, but the thing about cold outreach or cold calling is there is a predictability to it for whatever industry you're in for every hundred dials you make you're going to reach a certain number of people and for every certain number of people you meet you reach you're going to identify opportunities something going on in those companies and then for every certain number of opportunities they'll convert into appointments eventually. So it's it's understanding those metrics for your particular industry, the particular product or service that you're selling uh, and building those success metrics. And most people don't, like even most salespeople delude themselves about their closing ratio and their average sales side. You know, when, when I would start uh, an engagement with a client, the first thing I would ask them is what's your average sale? And they would say, well, it could be all over the place. It could be $5,000. It could be, you know, a million dollars. Well, you can't build a sales plan without understanding what those metrics are, mm -hmm. right? And there's always an average, right? My second grade math teacher, you know, let me, let me talk to her. You know, did, did you declare a certain amount of revenue to the IRS when you, when you uh, uh, filed your taxes? Or did you give them a range? You know, it might be from here to here, you know, did you, did you have an infinite number of customers or a finite number of customers. I mean, it's easy to find what your average is or the mean is, you know, I mean, it's, it's a mathematical surety. So, um, so a lot of it is what I find is success. A lot of times uh, revolves around understanding what those metrics are in order for you to acquire a customer, you know, close that customer and then keep that customer. Yeah. Well, that's a key element is, is, you know, what are the road, what are the road signs, what are the posts along the, along the way that you should keep, uh, keep an eye out for so that you make sure you're, you know, you're headed in the right direction. So it speaks to the issue of having a process of having a methodology. So can you kind of walk us through what you would suggest is, and I know this might be different for different businesses, but. You know, what's what, what's a common process that everyone can you know benefit from based on your experience well first of all you have to understand you know what the activity levels are right david sandler called it minimum daily activities right what how many calls do i need to make each day how many emails do i send need to send out so you have to start somewhere and even if you start um, from a company perspective with, you know, making 10 dials a day or 20 dials a day into, um, in, in, into whatever database you're currently working with to identify um, those customers uh, and making sure you have good data that you've identified the right target market as well. Uh, and, uh, and then as you make those calls on a regular basis, then you can start to, and if you measure it, you can start, a, you know, for every X number of calls, like I said, out of every hundred calls, I'm going to reach a certain number of, uh, of, of decision makers or influences or, uh, in a company. And then, you know, from that point, how many of those are doing something that's meaningful for me? Because for me, the, the epiphany for me was I was working with 75 different types of companies from staffing to ERP to CRM to Y2K to custom application development. And because I worked with so many different companies, 
I had a limited amount of time to work with these companies. And so the real epiphany was I was doing the same thing I was doing in the moving and storage business, right? I want to know, you know, because they started, I'd go in and they'd tell, tell me what your company does. And they'd start talking bits and bites and my eyes would glaze over and I would, you know, just start losing it. I'm like, talk to me like a three-year-old, you know, I'm the CEO of a company. What will your product do for me? You know, what, what is it, what value is it going to bring to me? And, uh, and then they'd go, oh, and they could explain it to me in five minutes. And then I needed to understand who in the company they needed to talk to, who were the potential buyers or influencers. Um, uh, what made them a good prospect for me? Because one of the things I found out were a lot of people were salespeople were prospecting companies that really weren't even a good fit for them, but they never took the time to really um, check into it. And then lastly, you know, when will they be evaluating whatever products or services that, uh, that I'm selling? So, so I was able to simplify kind of the process um, in, into three components that I needed to understand. And then it gets a little more complicated after that in terms of uh, building a success model. But, but the, the biggest thing is measuring it. Most people don't have an idea yeah. or they just throw salespeople, you know, into a room or hire an SDR, give them a script and, mm -hmm. you know, and that's it. And that's as far as they go. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things that we're really good about at Elite Corp was, real-time coaching we used a process called sales navigation i worked with some guys early on in the moving business from dale carnegie and our team leaders would sit there on calls with um our sdrs and uh, and like anything else everybody needs a coach and things will creep into your call approach that you don't even realize you're doing um a lot of the sales reps i started working with basically uh when they were making calls not in so many words, but what they were really saying is you're not doing anything or you don't really need us. So, so the way they approached it, um, just, just put off the customers. Uh, and so consequently they weren't, you know, engaging with potential prospects on the phone. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, one, one of, uh, a guy named Steve Shipman, who was a big telemarketing guru back in like the seventies and eighties, you know, he said, it shouldn't be that difficult. You're just having conversations with people. It's really not, not that tough, you know? So, so in terms of the approach that you take, uh, when you go to pick up the phone, it, it makes a big difference. So, so you mentioned a couple things along the way here that uh, were learnings, uh, you know, for you and your team. But you know, what are some of the just to highlight a couple of them? What what were some of the uh, I'll say mistakes that small to medium sized companies you know often make in their in their cold outreach uh, efforts? Right. Um, the biggest thing is is that they don't have good expectations because they haven't done it, especially a lot of small companies where, you know, I'm dealing with a lot of technical companies. A lot of these companies were started by technical guys that weren't really salespeople. Um, the plus side is they're very passionate about their business. So once they got in front of a potential customer, that really came across um, to them. So their biggest challenge was getting that in initially get in front of the customer. And because they had never really had any kind of formal sales training or never you know, been in a position where they were cold calling that when they go to hire somebody, they really don't have clear expectations in terms of what those success metrics should be mm -hmm. and you need to build them. So the biggest thing is uh, managing those people, training them, coaching them uh, to so that they can accelerate uh, and, uh, you know, be, be successful as quickly as possible because it is a you know, can be a grind if you don't have somebody there that's that's kind of uh, constantly uh, um, supporting you uh, and also, uh, you know, motivating you. Right. Um, and, and doing this solo uh, is, is really brutal. Yeah. Yeah. yeah there, there's a fair amount of, of turnover in. Well, you know, better than anyone uh, in, in in the role specifically geared towards uh, appointment setting BDR you know, cold outreach, but, uh, you know, there, there are ways to, to get, well, let's, let's, let's get to that in a second. But, um, you, you mentioned a couple situations that you uh, highlighted some success, but can you give us one that, um, maybe highlights, um, the, the way in which you implemented cold outreach and what kind of, um, success did that drive for that company? Uh, sure. Uh, there were, um, we were, we were doing about a million dollars a year with Nortel networks. And at the time we were really just selling them the reload leads. So they flew me down to Richardson, Texas 
to um, to train their inside sales team. And I was able to improve. They, they were already happy with the conversion rate. They were getting about a 20% conversion rate um, to uh, bank qualified leads uh, from our raw leads that we were providing them. And I was able to increase that by about 30%. But uh, the, the one thing that, that made, I'm, I'm very passionate about the small to mid-sized businesses. And I had an experience where uh, I was working with a, a local, you know, uh, uh, managed service provider network, Microsoft partner. And, uh, he, uh, he had brought me into his office and he was doing a couple million dollars a year. And he shows me, he's got this spreadsheet that showed what he spent with me. And after he paid me, paid, you know, all his expenses, uh, the guy put an extra 250 grand in his pocket, mm. you know, I mean, for me, I mean, we were generating probably at least tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of billions of dollars for Nortel. But, you know, that, that was this guy's daughter's college, you know, yeah. I mean, that was, that was pretty special. Yeah. So we've really changed the paradigm because at the time, uh, when I started working with Microsoft, they said to me, you know, well, we give our partners sales leads and they tell me the leads suck. I'm like, well, what if we just set appointments for them? And, uh, and we kind of changed the, the paradigm and changed the dynamic there. And every single one of my, co- I mean, I sold, literally hundreds of thousands of dollars to sales leads to companies that never got any business. And I mean, I even went out, trained them, begged them, controlled them, took them out to dinner and lunch to try to get them to do something. But um, virtually every customer I ever had at Elite Corp uh, closed business from the appointments we set for them. Um, And that that would that was a big deal, especially for a lot of these small businesses that didn't have the resources to do uh, uh, to do what we were doing at the time. Yeah, so it, so it's great if you're adding incremental value. Certainly, adding um, additional dollars to their top line income statement is is huge. Uh, yeah. And 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 for the effort uh, that you put in, and the and the you know price, if you will, that they're they're uh, paying to you, the the incremental revenue is uh, you know should be you know certainly x fold greater in return than uh, than than what they're they're paying out. So in many circles, um, there's a thought that cold outreach is kind of passe, that in today's world with the internet and ability to you know, search on almost any term and AI certainly, uh, that people are doing their own investigations of potential suppliers for their product problems. So by the time a, a potential client contacts you as a supplier, you know, they've done whatever, 40, 50, 60% of the research and they're just looking for, you know, some pricing terms and delivery terms. So in, in that landscape, how, you know, how do you see cold outreach fitting in? I mean, I've got an opinion, but it'd be, be interesting to hear what you might think. Well, I've been in the service business all my life. And uh, if you're selling a commodity, yeah, you can go out on Amazon and buy it if you know what you want and it's already spec'd out. But for the most part in the service industry, people buy from people they like and people they trust. And that starts, the relationship starts with an initial conversation mm-hmm. with a call. And, uh, that's something that will never change. I mean, every uh, every web webinar I've attended on AI, the the net net is yes, there are some redundant tasks that that AI can probably do for you, but they'll never replace the salesperson. So establishing that relationship, and and I think some of the things, you know, I always tell anybody I'm training that this has nothing to do with what we're selling. It is everything to do with what that client needs. And that's a function of asking questions, you know, doing, doing your research for one, never go in, make a call. You should always have something to engage with them for based on what you found out about the company, the news that's on their website, you know, changes in management, relocating, something's going on that you can talk to them about. And everybody appreciates the fact, I mean, it infuriates me when somebody calls me and tries to sell me something and has no idea what I do. You know, I mean, 
do a, you know, do a little work. Even if you say, Hey, look, I, you know, I checked out your website and I think there might be an opportunity, but can you help me understand what you do? Ask me some questions. Yeah. You know, as a business owner, the first thing I want to talk about is my business, yeah. you know? So, uh, ask me some questions, do a little research, you know, have a little knowledge. And then additionally, if you promise to do me, do something for me and follow up, you know, I, I, People are, are, are really, uh, it, it's, it's a challenge to get people to understand, you know, the expression, the devil's in the details. I mean, I'm always, people are having conversations and now you can re even record the conversations, but, you know, there are pieces that you can pick up, you know, personal pieces about them, their family, their vacation, you know. Um, I think I might, might have shared with you, we, we were talking to this one guy and I had a new guy I was hiring. And uh, he asked us to mail him some information. I'm like, you know, trying to be environmentally friendly. You know, we don't, you know, mail stuff out. Mm -hmm. You know, well, we could send you an email. And he says, look, he says, at the end of the day, you know, you've got two piles in front of you. He says, you got a pile of ground up iPads and you got a pile of ground up paper. Which one would you rather eat? And we, you know, we, we all laughed about it. And when we got done, the, the, the kids, you know, putting down, you know, he's looking for this, looking for that. I'm like, where's, where's the bit about the, the ground up iPads, you know, three months from now, when we call this guy back, you know, a hundred other people are going to have called him and you can differentiate yourself by referencing that conversation. He'll remember that, yeah. you know? And, yeah. uh, and so, so there's personal details that people miss, especially if they're making a lot of calls and, and there's no excuse not to put that in your CRM and not have to be, be part of your notes. But, but that's huge. I mean, we set an appointment for one of our clients for Rita's Water Ice by talking to the uh, EA for the CFO. It was a $2 million gig. And we talked about her, you know, vacation plans in Wildwood, New Jersey, mm. you know, for two months. And we were one of three vendors. It would have been a better story if they won the, won the bid. But they were on the short list. They were one of only three vendors that got to bid on the opportunity, mm. you know, and, and that had everything to do with that personal relationship. You know, so that can come from anywhere. So cold calling is not going away. Cold conversations, you know, if somebody has a choice between buying something, you know, uh, from an unknown quantity or buying somebody for, that's been diligently calling them, recalling the conversations, taking good notes, calling them back when they said they would, uh, you know, it, you'll, you'll definitely differentiate yourself. And the average salesperson won't, most people are used to a salesperson promising them something and then not, not following through on it. Yeah. Well, yeah, I think you bring up an important point about developing relationships. You know, it's, if, if you, I'll say, wait, I know that isn't necessarily the, the way people are doing it, but if you wait for people to contact you because they've surfed your website or, you know, whatever, and then have submitted forms and, or send you an RFP, you know, you, you're, you're kind of setting yourself up for failure there versus having to have at least some effort to develop that relationship early in their, in their buying process. And that, in my opinion, that's the key is, are you mapping into the buying process and complex sales? You want to be able to enable your clients to buy from you, not so much you're selling them something. So if you can, if you can have a cold outreach program that taps into their buying process early, you get you get an advantage by developing that relationship and shaping their their requirements. Um, you know, there's a, a variety of uh, methodologies that you know that could be put in place to help um, shape the requirements document to bias towards your offering if you've been able to get in front of them early in the process. And, you know, so cold calling, exactly. cold calling allows that. I'd, I'd rather uh, write the RFP than respond to an RFP that's been written by my competitor. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So the earlier in, and a lot of sales guys, sales guys are challenged because they're measured on what they're going to close this quarter. So there's always that sense of urgency. So a lot of times things that are farther out, a client I, I'm recently working with in since March, we've got a pipeline of over, uh, over a hundred opportunities that we've identified. And some of them, you know, are two, three years out. And like you said, the, the earlier you get in there and the earlier you, you start developing that relationship, the more likely, uh, they, they you'll at least get the at bat there. Yeah. Uh, and, but that requires a lot of nurturing and, for the most part, it's five minute calls. I mean, sometimes they get 
protracted. My guy was on a 40 minute call with a new prospect, you know, two, two weeks ago, you know, and, and he's apologizing because his call band suffered. And I'm like, that's, that's going to pay huge, huge dividends in, uh, you know, in the future. Mm -hmm. I mean, that conversation with that guy, it's, you know, they talked about golf. They he, the guy worked for the government. He's telling him, you should get a government job, pension, vacation, you know, you'll be taken care of for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. But yeah, you know, so all that stuff is really important. You just never know, especially, I mean, our conversations can go into politics, into weather, you know, it doesn't, whatever's going on in their life, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, so uh, just moving forward, looking out in your crystal ball, what, what do you see are some of the trends in the industry? You know, you mentioned, you know, a number of things here in the conversation so far, but you kind of consolidated down into on a three that you see in, in, in business development, uh, what, what, what should we pay, be paying attention to now? Well, it, it, we talked about it before in doing these kind of activities. I, I think the, high, the, the remote working environment, and we're seeing more and more companies come back to the office. I, it, it's just brutal doing it and managing somebody in a remote environment. So bringing, people coming back into the office and most people want to come in the office, at least on a, on a, on a part-time basis, on a hybrid basis. I think that interaction, uh, being able to share experiences with people is, 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 is going to be big. Mm -hmm. Um, the, the, the other thing is, you know, contact data is grading at 38.6% a year. I personally, if I buy data, I buy URLs, uh, phone numbers, uh, company names and mailing addresses. That's it, because uh, the companies. I don't care who it is. Zoom Info, Exact Data. They they can't keep up with the attrition. In, in a normal environment, uh, thirty eight point six percent of a hundred contacts will will change during the course of the year. So it's really difficult to keep good contacts in your database. There's so much moving moving around. Um, so I think building and managing that data. The better the data, the better the results. Uh, and the only way you're going to be able to um, to get good data is to build it and then to maintain it. You know, our process is to every 90 days, we're at least doing a check-in to make sure that person's still there uh, because you never know when the, they're going to. It, we, we had two instances this week where we had opportunities that we identified that actually moved forward uh, a year so by calling them every 90 days it, you know if somebody if somebody had called them two years from now that deal would have been gone they would have been missed so keeping up with that because things are changing within companies so so i think those changes and that's why people buy something because something's changing in the company mm -hmm. i think being on top of those changes and understanding what they are uh is is going to be uh big in terms of uh um, you know, staying on top of, of your cold outreach. And the other thing is the metrics constantly change, uh, depending upon how difficult it is to get a hold of people. So you have to keep uh, abreast of what those changing success metrics, uh, success metrics are. Mm -hmm. um, so you, you really have to be looking and measuring them on a, you know, on a consistent basis. Yeah. yeah, one of those, uh, we didn't talk about it at, at length there, but you know, if you're if you're making outbound phone calls as an example uh, to cell phones you know today most people maybe not all but most people if they see a number coming in that they don't recognize you know they don't answer it so there's you know, as far as innovation there's ways i would suspect that you uh, coach your team on how to leave messages as opposed to uh you know, trying to wait until you actually get somebody on the phone because that may never happen and so you have to, your first uh, entree might be leave a compelling message. What is that? What's the hook, you know, so that, so that they uh, feel compelled to ideally call you back. But if you call again, at least they've got some frame of reference of why you're calling and are more likely to, to answer the phone. Um, but so, so just, um, we, we talked about this a little bit earlier is uh, motivation and how do you how do you personally stay uh, motivated and looking for new ways to innovate and then kind of the second question there is how do you keep your team motivated because again it, it you know this is not meant for everybody not everybody is cut out for just pure 
uh, cold calling or appointment setting. Certainly, if you're in sales, you, you need to you need to do it. So you need to have that commitment to to make it happen. But how do you how do you keep uh, your team motivated uh, when you know a, a one in whatever the number is, a one in ten or two in ten response rate is uh, is is considered pretty good. Um, my mantra is always to celebrate the small victories. Mm -hmm. Every day there's something that, that's been done. Uh, at the end of every day, we do challenges and success, successes. You know, we do it in a team environment. So we share, you know, what are the things that you struggle with today and, uh, and throw it out to the team. And typically, you know, there'll, there'll be some lively discussions, but we'll, we always end the day with, Talk about, you know, a success that you had today, something that even if you didn't schedule an appointment, you finally got a hold of somebody, even if it was a no, you know, so you, you move them off the list for another 90 days uh, in terms of uh, having to call them. Um, sometimes they just have some really interesting conversations or they identify an opportunity, um, but there's always something um, that uh, that can be celebrated uh, each day in terms of what they did. Uh, and then it, it's, it's the ongoing coaching, as I said, you know, every, everybody needs a coach mm -hmm. and, and by sitting there and listening in on conversations that you can tweak little things in their, uh, in their call approach that may have impacted their, their success. Um, but the team environment is a big thing around, um, how, keeping people motivated, you know, reason number one reason why people um, stay at the place they work is the people they work with so if they're working with a, a team and they're doing the same thing and they're able to share those challenges and uh share those successes that that's a big thing in helping them but but they all i mean the the can the ongoing coaching you're a golfer i know you know and one little change uh, can have a, a huge impact mm -hmm. on what you're doing. You know, you open your stance a little, you close your stance, you move your thumb. There's, there's, there are little things that, that you don't even realize you're doing that can have an impact on, uh, uh, you know, on your performance overall. Right. And that's what I always like to work with to find something um, that, that they can work on that will help them to continually improve uh, on a day in and day out basis. Yeah. Uh, that, that's great advice. Yeah. I, there's so many in golf, there's so many things you have to do right. You know, you do one thing wrong and, you know, it's, so I'm still trying to find the right combination of all the right things to do to get my touring card. So I'm not, not quite there yet. There you go. <laughs> so, so this has been great, Bill, just, uh, just kind of wrapping up. Um, if you could, if you could give one piece of advice to a business owner for scaling up their cold outreach activities and capabilities, what, what would you point to? Okay. Well, a couple of things, know your metrics. You got to build and you got to know your, you got to know what your metrics are and don't delude yourself and then keep monitoring them. Um, training. If, if you haven't done it, find a coach, find somebody to, to provide training, especially if you haven't done it, you won't be able to, um, to, to train a new person and they're going to get frustrated very quickly. Um, and then, uh, you know, as I said, we all own call avoidance, you know, a buddy of mine once said the most difficult thing about running is lacing up your sneakers, you know, just pick up the phone, just do it. You know, I mean, dial the phone, commit yourself to make and start, you know, 10 dials a day. It's not a big deal. Don't, you know, don't overwhelm yourself. Um, and then, um, and the other thing is if you're going to start an internal program, like an SDR program, you you never want to bring in just one person. You got to bring in at least two and have, have a team because you don't know mm -hmm. you can't, you can't build success metrics on one individual. You know, you have to have multiple individuals that you can go to, uh, to identify uh, where they should be and, and also to accelerate the, uh, um, the success of the, the people in that role. Mm -hmm. But, but the biggest thing I would say is just pick up the phone, you know, make a commitment to doing it. Everybody will find some other reason to not make cold calls. But, uh, if you start small, uh, then you can build on it. That's great. Great. Well, Bill, this has been an extremely insightful and educational uh, 45 minutes or so for me. Uh, hopefully that's also the case for our podcast listeners. Thank you so much for your time in preparing and for contributing today. Uh, how can people get a hold of you if they want to contact you? 
Ah, sure. Uh, they can reach me. The, the best thing to do is best thing to do is call me yeah. at 610-220-7545. You can reach me there anytime. I'd be happy to have a conversation with you or help you out in any way I can. That's great. Um, this is a little piece of the puzzle that I own, you know, but so uh, and that I know better than anybody else on the planet, especially with the clients that I work for. And, and Traditionally, I work with technology companies, um, a lot of times managed service providers, but I've, I've worked with all different types of companies from moving and storage to uh, uh, to very sophisticated technologies. So happy to have a conversation with anybody. It's my passion. It's what I do. And uh, and for me, uh, I'm more than happy to have a, to talk to anybody that would like to. Great, great, great. Well, thank you, Bill, again. And to our listeners, uh, hope you enjoyed today's episode. Uh, Please subscribe to Scaling Up and give us a five-star rating on your favorite podcasting platform. And don't forget to tune in next time to explore additional strategies behind successful business growth. Until then, keep scaling up. Thank you.